human beings have always needed to communicate. And what would any human rights movement be if people couldn't speak with each other? There are three reasons why the ability to express ourselves is so important. Firstly, it's a human need to be ourselves and have our own identity. Secondly, it's the foundation for other rights and freedoms. And thirdly, it's the basis of social and economic development. But communication is not just the way we do things, it's also a human right in itself. Beyond face-to-face -face conversation, we need tools or platforms to communicate. A megaphone goes farther than a human voice, a radio transmitter even further. Communication technologies, whether cave paintings, wall posters, books, print or broadcast, use what we call a one-to-many model of communication. There is one source of content that is distributed to an audience and that source holds great power. Understandably, human rights groups have focused their work on the source of that content, government, journalist, artist or owner, challenging any censorship. But now a new model of communication is emerging, peer-to-peer, -peer, where the creation and sharing of content is distributed between many people through means that are digital and accessible by a broad range of devices, from the mobile phone to computer to TV or radio. We can now bypass gatekeepers and communicate directly with each other. How can we understand this new communications environment? It can be thought of as having a number of layers. Firstly, the infrastructure, the basic cables, wireless towers, hardware that carry digital material, without which free expression human rights are meaningless. Secondly, connectivity, the means by which devices connect to the digital world. This was very important in Iran recently, when the government used mobile phone technology to track people speaking to each other about the protests. Thirdly, the applications, the ways we access digital content and whose importance we saw when the government of China tried to make all computers sold there have preloaded censorship software. And of course, there's the content, what we actually see, hear and watch. What's different now is that while 20 years ago, human rights actors couldn't care less about the type of newsprint or TV camera being used, now all of these layers are part of the struggle for human rights, and all of them need to be shaped by human rights principles. But it's not just policymakers who shape modern communications. It's being driven by innovative businesses, by attempts at government to control things, and most radically, by users themselves who are changing the way we communicate in a way that is unprecedented. These are disruptive and transformative technologies. What does this mean for human rights? These are not merely new technologies in the way that broadcast was different to print. The emergence of peer-to-peer -peer types of collaboration alongside the one-to-many model is a shift equivalent to Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. For example, it is not that one-to-many models are dying out, although some, such as newspapers, are finding survival increasingly difficult, but that the one-to-many model exists, is being challenged and being mutated by peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And this is a challenge for many traditional forms of authority. What do we trust in a world of abundant information and often uncivil opinions? It also challenges traditional models of working, Hierarchies find it difficult to work in a viral world where information can be challenged and questioned. Human rights groups are often organised around traditional models with disciplined and controlled messages, but this no longer has traction with people who are used to viral working. In the past, no one worried about technology, the pipe, that delivered the content. Who cared where the newsprint came from? But in the digital world, content is often reshaped by the pipe. So we need to apply human rights standards and values to the whole communication environment, not just to the content. The enemies of human rights are rising to the challenge. Barbed wire is being erected across all the communication layers. Burma doesn't like coverage of anti-government demonstrations, so it shuts down the whole infrastructure. Equipment that provides network access is used to block sites for political reasons anywhere in the world. 
Google applications are restricted for use in China. But the tools that help us get past the barbed wire are also multiplying. Mobile phones can stream police brutality to the web in Iran. Digital cameras record ill treatment in Abu Ghraib prison. SMS can mobilize millions and topple presidents, as it did in the Philippines. Farsi websites can provide the medium for Persian poetry and Iranian politics, denied in conventional space. The dizzying prospect for the human rights movement is the capacity to democratize freedom of expression itself, to wrest the platforms of communication from the hands of elites, government, business or professional. Of course, there are many anxieties about these changes. What's happening to journalism or to the rights of artists? Will paedophiles and Nazis dominate this new world? Will the banal or offensive nature of some digital communication drown out good quality information, analysis and opinion in the sound of the crowd? But if we think back to the invention of the printing press, the Gutenberg era, there were similar anxieties over making the Bible available to ordinary people. What would they do with the information? How would they interpret it? Wouldn't irresponsible preachers exploit gullible peasants? How could authority be sustained in such a world? Now some people did go crazy. It needed a period of literacy, including developing the ability to understand metaphor and abstract thought for the power of books to emerge. But the Gutenberg era ushered in, after a long period of struggle and some periodic craziness, democracies that protected and promoted human rights. The network communications environment offers us a new ability to strengthen a faltering democracy movement worldwide and to further boost and promote human rights. But this will only happen if the human rights movement understands the importance of influencing the whole communication environment across all of the layers. It will only happen if it learns how to use new tools and it will only happen if human rights organizations change the way they work to embrace collaboration and sharing rather than insisting upon control.